My name is Gilbert Tostevin. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. Anthropology is divided into four subfields, and they overlap to varying degrees. Biological anthropology, which is the study of the evolutionary history of humans and primates. Archaeology, which is the study of the material culture produced and the cultural behavior in general produced by humans in all times and places. Cultural anthropology, which is the study of how humans find meaning in the present day among different cultural groups. We also have linguistic anthropology, it's the fourth subfield in anthropology, and that's the study of languages and how people communicate as a cultural uh, phenomenon. I'm an archaeologist, so I study humans through the material culture they've made and left in the geological record. I wanted to go into university to get my bachelor's, and I wanted to actually produce something new. Archaeology is a great way of doing that. I went on excavations as an undergraduate and I saw how amazing it could be to uncover an artifact that might be 200,000 years old. And the last person to touch this was not a modern human. That's why I got into anthropology. I am working on excavation and analysis of Upper Paleolithic time period, which is the time period around which Neanderthals disappeared and modern humans replaced them. I'm interested in why we survived, whereas they did not. One of the hypotheses that I think is more interesting is the use of the landscape socially. Neanderthals were known to actually use very little of their landscape in terms of relations with other Neanderthal groups. And we know this by looking at how they moved rock from geological sources into the sites where they left their stone tools. They don't move their stone tools around very much. Modern humans did. They would contact people over great distances, as many as 200 kilometers away. We could rely upon other humans across the landscape as sort of social security nets. One of the things I do is teach people how to make stone tools. Flint napping, this is called. This is the oldest technology humans have ever made and it's also still the sharpest technology we can make. Lasers are not as sharp as stone tools, and neither is steel. It's an art form, it's also something that archeologists do to learn how people did it in the past. It is really knocking two rocks together. Even something from as simple as a stone tool will lead you to start talking about kinship systems and morals. So this is a, a hand axe, the fact that it's immoral in a given society to wed before you make one of these. By looking at how this might have been produced in one context versus being produced in this other context, I could actually learn if people were learning from each other 50,000 years ago. Did we learn from them? Did they learn from us? What was that interaction? You can get that from something as simple as a stone tool. There are two 1,000 level anthropology courses which are perfect for freshmen. The first is Anthropology 1001, Human Evolution, which is a course on biological anthropology and the study of how we came to be the way we, we are today through our biological evolution. There's also a course called 1003, Understanding Cultures, and it teaches the anthropological understanding of cultural variability and how, why people behave the way they do in different cultural contexts around the globe today. Well, I've taught a seminar, it was actually an honors seminar, and this year I'm going to be teaching it as a freshman seminar, a course on learning anthropology through science fiction. The reason particularly for teaching anthropology to freshmen through a class on science fiction is to show how the questions that anthropology asks are in fact very, very similar to the questions that science fiction asks. I pair anthropology texts and science fiction texts. Frank Herbert's Dune to teach cultural ecology, how humans adapt environmentally to different locations. Ursula K. Le Guin's Left Hand of Darkness. She incorporates a lot of anthropology into her works, primarily by taking an ethnographic perspective. And this makes a lot of sense because her father was Alfred Kroeber, one of the founding fathers of anthropology in North America. I also use work of earlier sort of classic golden age science fiction. H.P. Lovecraft, who's great for teaching archaeology. Usually the horrific side of, of archaeology. You don't know what you're going to find. Robert Heinlein to teach kinship systems. And I use more modern steampunk novelists like Neil Stevenson, Snow Crash, and The Diamond Age to teach globalization. These are some of the issues that you see in science fiction, and you see them in anthropology, and you see them in the present day. 